Hello, everyone. This is Melini from Marco 7. Thank you all for attending today's webinar, Delivering Packaging Innovation for a Circular Economy, brought to you in partnership with Inks International. Before we begin, I would like to cover a few housekeeping. As you can see at the bottom of your screen are multiple application widgets you can use. All the widgets are resizable and movable, so feel free to move them around to get the most out of your desktop space. If you have any questions during the webinar, you can submit them through the Q&A widget. We will try to answer as many as possible during the webinar, but if a fuller answer is needed or we run out of time, we will make sure to follow up with you in a separate email after the webinar. A copy of today's slide deck and additional health materials are available in the resource list. We encourage you to download any resources or bookmark any links you may find useful. For the best viewing experience, we recommend using a wired internet connection and closing any programs or browser sessions running in the background. At this point, I would like to briefly introduce you to our moderator. Joining us today, we've got Shane Birch, Vice President of Strategic Planning and Innovation at Inc. International. Thank you. Thanks, Malini. And on behalf of Inks International, PepsiCo, and Gatorade, we'd like to thank you all for joining our webinar today, uh, Delivering Packaging Innovation for a Circular Economy. We'll cover a brief background of both myself, the moderator, Shane Birch, as well as our panelists. Uh, we'll cover the objectives of the web webinar today and move into a panel discussion followed by audience Q&A. So as Malini had mentioned, please feel free to submit your questions throughout the webinar today. So our panelists, um, again, Shane Birch, I'll be the moderator today, and I am Vice President of Strategic Planning and Innovation for Inks International. We have Javi Cortadella, or I'm sorry, ja Chavi Cortadellas, uh, who is head of innovation and emerging brands for Gatorade. Chavi is in charge of creating the innovation vision and pipeline for Gatorade and other PepsiCo fitness brands. Chavi also leads the Gatorade Emerging Brands team and is responsible for the growth of these brands into digital, direct-to-consumer e-commerce and new technologies. Chavi was born in Barcelona where he earned a degree in architecture. He has a strong sports performance and design background stemming from his 11 years of experience with Nike in Spain, Mexico, and Brazil, and his nine years in Gatorade. Neil and CISO is the Senior Director of Packaging R&D at PepsiCo. Neil leads the team that is responsible for packaging development and innovation for the Tropicana, Naked Juice, One, Izzy, Cavita, and Gatorade beverage businesses. Neil is also responsible for the sustainability agenda as it relates to beverage packaging materials for the North America beverages business. Neil has a long career in the packaging industry with prior experiences in Kraft Foods and Johnson & Johnson. A little about inks. Uh, Inks is a global manufacturer of high-performance printing inks and coatings for commercial packaging and digital print applications with full-service locations in North America, South America, and Europe. Inks is dedicated to driving increased sustainability throughout the value chain, including suppliers, customers, as well as the communities and regions within which it operates. 
Inc. seeks to proactively work with supplier partners to bring forward best solutions uh, that minimize resources, the environmental impact, and improve economic returns. The objectives today for our webinar, we will provide insights into sustainable packaging innovation and how leaders are engaging and investing in the future of circular economy. We will outline the key challenges related to packaging beverage recycling and the new developments that are required to address these challenges. We'll look at the opportunities to drive the sustainability agenda forward, and we'll embrace new ways of working to accelerate successful circular economy solutions to market. So this begins the discussion and we'll engage the panel the first two questions will be directed to Neil and Chavi both. As a brand owner, what are the key sustainability issues and packaging implications that you are facing today? And to guide the suppliers and converters, where do you see opportunities for innovation that will help move the industry forward? Neil? Hi, uh, thank you so much. Uh, so how PepsiCo looks at it, you can look at it in, in, in two different formats. And if you look to the left, we, we, we have the three key pillars of reduce, uh, recycle, reinvent. And, and we truly mean those. I think one of the biggest things when you think of sustainability is there is no one size fits all. So the way PepsiCo is looking at it is uh, we're going to need multiple levers. We're going to need multiple um, the variables that we could take a look at uh, from that. So if you look at the recycling, how are we making, uh, one, the, our materials better? And uh, from a plastic standpoint, uh, we're, we're not looking at completely eliminating plastic. We, we do have initiatives against uh, reducing it, um, but we also wanna make plastic better. So how is it being sourced? How is it being uh, created? Uh, and what are we doing with it? Um, reducing plastic, uh, as I just said, what are alternatives to that forum and what have you? And what are we doing to uh, lessen our dependence on that material? Uh, reinventing, again, falling in that same forum. What's beyond the bottle? So this is two things. One, how do we improve our current bottle is it on those separate forums? But two, uh, what, what's past that? Uh, we, we look at how we've done things in the, in the past, and it's, and it's been through delivering uh, ready to drink. Are there other formats? Are there things beyond what a typical bottle would look like? Um, and then lastly, uh, definitely engaging the consumer. Uh, this is this is a partnership with the consumer. Uh, one, what we can provide, and then two, what the consumer can tell us, uh, and, and how do we how do we get better as a group? So, so um, another way to look at it is um, the, the four pillars that we look at: reduce, um, again, reducing the materials to circular plastics. That's about getting more plastics, uh, reusing plastics again. Um, how do we get that recycled material back into the bottle and actually into other areas as well beyond PET? Um, as many of you know, uh, PepsiCo is, is is a heavy user of PET, so we want to look at recycled polyethylene. But then we're also looking at how are we getting recycled materials back into back into the closures, uh, back into the, into the labels. Okay. Um, the beyond plastics, you can see it. We're looking at alternate. Formats. Uh, what is that beyond that plastic bottle? Uh, beyond that PET bottle, what can we do from that, whether it be fibers, whether, whether it be aluminums, but we also have to balance that as well. Uh, we don't want to jump to a new format and it can have, it can have greater detriment to the environment uh, than, than what we're seeing today. And then lastly, uh, this is this is one of the baselines of for what we're doing is, is greenhouse gas. And as it relates to uh, the climate uh, and global temperature, uh, from that, how are we reducing our greenhouse gas effects um, on the planet, specifically through package. packaging, has a large impact of the footprint um, that the company will need to be looking at. So uh, one more page forward, we can give some specifics on, on each of these. There uh, we go. So uh, lightweighting, when we say lightweighting, um, it, it's beyond what we traditionally do. I think uh, in the past, uh, 
most companies pillars was around sustainability was just lightweight and that was just for cost savings uh, we're looking at it getting advanced technologies and lightweighting so past that five percent lightweighting how do we get to it where we're getting down to the lowest possible but also um we're not just lightweight to lightweight we need to take the consumer into account for well, so we're going to have ergonomics. We're going to have functionality of the consumer. How are we still uh, providing that benefit for the structure of the package, making sure it's at the lowest weight possible, therefore reducing our dependency of plastic? Um, we touched upon this again. It, a lot of it is is not just recycled PET. It's it's the polyolefins of the world, uh, the caps, the closures, um, the labels, uh, the crates. Uh, the, the pallets that we're using. How can we get more recycled material back into those? So we're so we're truly creating that circular format for plastic. So there is actually use for plastics beyond it being something that we just find as a disposable item. Uh, the next one, uh, cleaning up our own house. Uh, this is a good one as far as uh, I'm sorry. One more page back, um, is is around that circular plastics and designing for recycling. So we do have some what I'll call problem child that, that, that we do need to filter out of our system making sure our labels, our shrink labels are recycle friendly. So their infrastructures that we have in the system today can be utilized to the greatest extent. Uh, so we wanna make sure we're working on is 100% uh, recycle, uh, recycle capable from the start. So uh, that's what we wanna be, we, our, our phrase is sustainable from the start. We wanna make sure that everything that we're putting out has recyclable capabilities, that's global. And then lastly, new formats. How are we looking at make my own? How are we looking at fibers? Um, looking at new technologies that uh, some are old that we're going to make new again, and some are new that we're trying to break through as well. But those are, if you frame up the four, that's how we look. Yeah, I can take it from here. Um, I think Neil did kind of a very good grounding on what are the technical problems to solve, but um, I think it's super important also to think about the consumer. And we believe that sustainability is not enough of a driver to change consumer behavior. You need to find something, a something else to you know force consumers to adopt new behaviors. I always like to refer to the electrical cars. It's kind of the whole revolution that we are seeing now with Tesla it's because their cars are cool, they are sexy. So it's kind of what's the sexiness or the coolness in our packaging that could drive consumers to adopt uh, new forms. Uh, we start kind of this journey, and that's one, one example of, uh, of the packaging platforms that we have, the GX platform. Started this journey uh, kind of a couple, uh, couple years ago, and we started with a premise that was not related to sustainability at all. It was this idea of a sports fuel personalization and the uniqueness of, uh, of every athlete. Shane, if you could click one more. So in essence, the, the GX platform, this is a, a sports fuel personalization platform uh, designed to fuel athletes that has two core components, uh, concentrate pods that uh, basically is kind of catered in a concentrate form um, uh, with a unique formula designed for every athlete, and then a reusable bottle that allows consumers kind of to use this bottle over and over again instead of a you know single use uh, plastic bottle. So basically, we take kind of the whole premise of decompose kind of a, a current Gatorade ready to drink bottle and kind of the vessel being reusable, concentrate form that we could uh, deliver to consumers, and then water that is available everywhere. Click one more. Shane, and I think that uh, the key, one of the key learnings on that is that on each one of the elements of the platform, you need to dra drive as much value as possible. And we discovered that this idea of uh, personalization should start with the bottle, make the bottle as cool as possible and offer athletes the opportunity to customize this, the, this bottle with uh, their name, number, uh, team colors, team marks, and you could imagine all the, all the things that you could do uh, with with bottles and kind of once is a reusable bottle, kind of the value prop has started becoming more interesting for uh, athletes that they want to spend time customizing this bottle and kind of thinking what what could be the cool design. And, and we take the insights from the footwear industry, right? So if athletes were already customizing their football cleats, why cannot customize uh, their uh, sports drink bottle? Quick one more. And that generate kind of basically kind of a, a new platform with a lot of new business opportunities. So what we call the, the ripple effect. So, you know, uh, new forms that are shippable via e-commerce, new bottles that now we could sell uh, in the sporting goods accounts, uh, new services, anchor and personalization that could be also digital, uh, D2C, et cetera. 
So it's a good example of how to you know, approach the problem in a different perspective and then kind of generating a, a business transformation uh, that goes beyond packaging. Click one more. So um, I think, you know, just thought there that maybe the future of packaging, it's, uh, you know, this combination of reusable vessels and more compact packaging. This is just one example of what applies to Gatorade. And we are right now on this journey on expanding our collection of vessels and expanding our collection of how we could make this beyond the bottle forms um, uh, uh, with powder, with tablets, with pods or other forms in the future, just to deliver convenience uh, to the to the consumer. So maybe not saying that the ready to drink bottle should disappear because it's very con uh, convenient for consumers, but maybe there is another way to approach the problem. And if we and if we look at it from a technical side, um, I think that's one of the important ones where it's it's a full. Uh, delivery system it's it's delivery it's changing the product it's changing the delivery system it's changing consumers habits as well as far as what can be acceptable from them and while we're still delivering that that top enjoyment from the product itself as well thanks neil and chavi so next as a significant brand owner how do you measure the impact of your sustainability program and initiatives Neil, you want to take this one? Uh, yeah, so so um, it, it's it's multiple approaches when we look at it. One is the sheer data of it. So um, how how are we looking at against our metrics? And we baseline our data from from past years um, with the, the key focuses that we're always improving uh, from it. So um, it's a measurement of against benchmark. It's a measurement against uh, the competitive set of what's the top technology out there um, from it. Um, and then obviously bringing in the consumer, what's the consumer impact of it? So we're, we're, we're trying to go out and, and make sure we're, we're getting that pulse from the consumer as far as does this make a change? Is it, does it matter uh, for you? And, and that's definitely a balance. Uh, some things that may be invisible to the consumer. So so uh, many, many of the things we do are, it's the right thing to do. It's the right thing for de uh, decreasing GHG uh, content, for example. Uh, so then we have to pair that. How are we messaging that out to the consumer without coming across as greenwashing? So everything we're trying to do is put against the guise of we need to make sure data is driving what we're doing versus um, putting it out there to make a nice show. So I would say uh, heavily data-driven, but with consumer in mind. Yeah, I, I will add on that two, two aspects. One is think about you know, what sustainability could mean with from a new business perspective, right? So in the case of GX or even in the case of powders and tablets, now all of a sudden we are seeing this as an incremental net revenue uh, via new distribution on e-commerce, etc. So sustainability could generate new business opportunities. And then the other one, I think it's super important, especially for big brands, is about the value of innovation. You know, consumers want their favorite brands to innovate and kind of be on the forefront. So I think that there's a halo back uh, to the brands that it's also super important to consider. With the watch out, as Neil says, that, you know, you avoid greenwashing. It's kind of, you need to be sure that what you are doing is right and you are not kind of presenting the smoke and mirrors uh, to the consumers, but do the right thing for the planet and for the environment. I think that consumers appreciate that as well. So I think that is a halo back to the brand that you could also measure that I think on the long term, uh, it needs to be accounted as part of the ROI of uh, any sustainability initiative. Yeah, so, you know, on that, and thank you, Chavi and Neil, you know, there's a, there's, there's a lot packed into that question and that answer. And, and oftentimes when we use facts and data, um, it, it for for the the support of really measuring the progress um it, it, which is extremely important to really make impacts it, it's it's often difficult to communicate that to a consumer and really can communicate the benefits how is it that pepsico and gatorade um work to make to to, to perhaps bridge that communication to drive and fuel the growth as well as um, make that stronger connection between the consumer and the brand? Yeah, I think that typically with consumers, we have 
stay away to focus specifically on sustainability. I think that at least my point of view is that you need to deliver specific advantages to the consumer that it's you know a great tasting product, it's super refreshing, it's personalized for you, whatever are the core values of the proposition. And then by the way, it helps in sustainability because this, this and that. So we typically don't live with sustainability messages. Um, and then we try to pack sustainability as part of a broader uh, consumer proposition. I think at the end, uh, to me, it's uh, like a little bit kind of like smartphones, right? So kind of all the dev- all the phones are smart right now, but kind of what else are you bringing to the consumer? Uh, that, that's my my point of view. Yeah, I, I would agree. I think I think the other part is is again sustainability isn't new, uh, but I think a lot of people are still being educated on it, whether it be from the business side or from the consumer side. So I think it's bringing them along with the journey as well, uh, making sure that, that we're giving it to them in, in, in understandable sound bites. Um, when you when you look at measuring sustainability, you have um, LCA or greenhouse gas, you have water, you have solid waste. Consumers, to tell you the truth, aren't going to be very educated on all three of those. Some will, don't get me wrong. There's a subsegment that will, but the vast majority, um, those are hard data. You have that fourth one, um, which I always throw in there, which isn't. It, it, it's more of a, 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 a qualitative uh, type of measurement of what is their perception. So again, that's where we are. We we need to bring them along with us. What does recycling mean? What does it? What does recycle content mean? So I think a lot of it uh, will be around educating the consumer and ourselves as well. What new ways of working are necessary to accelerate successful circular economy solutions to market? Yeah, I can take uh, first pass on this one. I'm I'm a huge believer of uh, open innovation. So I think that one of the tricks here for big companies like PepsiCo or big brands like Gatorade is to combine internal knowledge with external expertise that it could be coming from uh, you know, innovation agencies, uh, suppliers in the market that have new technologies, startups that have come up with kind of new materials, et cetera. But also, you know, uh, what, what are we hearing from consumers? And you know, in our case, from pro locker rooms, kind of what athletes and teams are doing that could be relevant to us. So when we approach innovation, we always try to kind of put all these uh, components uh, uh, in the blender and try to combine this internal expertise with external expertise and come up uh, with uh, solutions that could be implemented. Yeah, and it's definitely not a one size fits all. I think that's the other thing as well, is we, we, we have to be um, willing to take a look at some of these newer newer technologies that are out there and, and understand they won't be nationally distributed, globally distributed right off the bat. We're, we're still learning again um, what is the best thing out there. Scalability will always be something that that is, is, is a key aspect of when we're looking at this. So. Yeah, I will say that, that that's one of the key aspects that even some technologies that maybe could work for a smaller brands or a smaller business uh, maybe they don't have the scalability merits that are required for uh, Pepsi or Gatorade, right? So I think that for us, that uh, requires kind of a, the right due diligence on a scalability from the get-go and also the planning ahead. So if we are placing a bet on a new technology, what will be the capital requirements and the supply chain requirements that we will need down the road uh, to scale up this platform? So I, I think that this um, connectivity uh, with also internal stakeholders, and this, in this case could be supply chain, uh, logistics, finance, et cetera, just to kind of plan for the future success or rollout of these technologies. It's also another um, key takeaway. If not, you know, you could be that, you could start rolling out something that has merit a smaller scale, but you can never make it to the finish line because you have some barriers to uh, scalability that you have not planned up front. And a follow-on question here, how does uh, Pepsi work to, um, I'd say, partner with those critical either startups or suppliers or solution providers within the supply chain uh, to really help accelerate that scale up? 
Uh, that's a, that's a that's a really good question, and and it's it's not again a one size fits all for it. I think it, some of it depends on the application for it, and and what what is that market we're going after. Um, but what we 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 try to cast a wide net. We we don't want to uh, we we try not to get myopic on a single avenue. So I think that one of the biggest parts of the partnering is we're open to it. Uh, so we we definitely want to hear about it. We are definitely open to. Uh, looking at different things. Um, part of it is our internal mindset of knowing we we're going to have to go small before we go big or, or crawl before we walk, what, what have you. So um, Pepsi has definitely fostered that um, uh, type of capability, but we do have to prioritize. That's the other thing as well. There are, there, are mo there are more capabilities out there than we can handle right now. So I think the biggest thing is Pepsi is looking at how do we uh, rack and uh, how do we, how do we stack them all up, determine which one has the biggest impact and where can we go after yeah, another uh, page of the playbook, uh, think about kind of a multi-brand company like PepsiCo, that uh, potentially you could, you know, try and pilot some of these uh, new technologies or solutions with smaller businesses or smaller brands or specific markets or geographies, just to check if these solutions have merit, if they are well accepted by consumers, etc., and then bring them into the big leagues, right? So that's also kind of an approach that we could take uh, having the advantages of multiple uh, brands and multiple markets, it's kind of, you know, this idea of piloting, start small, see what happens, see what it sticks, et cetera, and then kind of bring it, bring it back to the mothership. So then when it moves from uh, Pepsi to a retailer, to a consumer, or through an e-commerce channel, um, a key component to circular economy is getting those materials back into the front end of the supply chain. How is it that Pepsi works um, after it leaves the retailer or after the consumer is finished to help enable that circular economy? Um, again, I, I would go back to one, we're designing it from the start. Uh, correctly, so we do. So we keep in mind that re that re returnable, recyclable infrastructure, um, especially when we look at a bottle platform. So are we making sure that I can go into the PET stream, and it's easy for our recyclers to be able to strip that down and get it back to us in good quality? At the end of the day, we we know that it's coming back to us, or that, that we have a strong desire for it to come back to us. So it's our it's in our it's in Pepsi's own interest to make sure when we put it out that it's the least amount of contaminants we could put out there that that, that it is compliant with the streams uh, from it. So um, one definitely keeping it in mind from the start. Two, it's it's around educating our consumers as well when they do get it. Um, if they have the capabilities, what are they supposed to do with it? So we have initiatives against that as well as communication on pack. Yeah, I think that the education piece, it's, it's a fundamental one, right? So consumers are willing to do the right thing, but many times they don't know how to do it. It's kind of, okay, do I need to strip the label? Do I need to kind of remove the cap? It's kind of where this bottle goes. You know, is this recyclable? This is not recyclable. It, it's very complex. And even as, you know, we, we talk with industry experts, even now ourselves, sometimes we need this education. Imagine for the, uh, the, the problem with the consumer. And I think for us as a lead brand in a sports, we have a major responsibility to educate athletes to do the right thing. So, you know, we at the end deal with kind of uh, young uh, athletes, young consumers. If they get, you know, this education at the early ages, they could be half as uh, good uh, citizens, uh, you know, for the rest of their lives. So we believe that through our brand and partnering, uh, you know, with some of the top leagues and teams that uh, uh, we deal with, that the education play, we will be, or we could be much more aggressive on that. And we are planning kind of new programs for the upcoming years and kind of just to bring that more on the forefront, right? So imagine, you know, what if, you know, on the NFL sidelines, we have, you know, recycling containers there and we see kind of how players are tossing you know, single-use bottles. That's a very powerful moment that we could do as a lead brand. And I think that we have an, uh, uh, an additional responsibility because of the role that the sports play in society. Thank you. How do you produce sustainable print without si sacrificing print quality and end-use performance? I think, Neil, we'll start with you on this one. 
Yeah. Um, so for us, as far as I, I wouldn't say this is a major impact to us, um, I, I would say maybe in one location that, that we are looking at this is actually on some of our recycle, uh, where we're looking at recycle friendly shrink labels. Um, to tell you the truth, we, we need to be able to match the print, but we actually have to have the print release from the, from the label as, as well. So um, I, I would say for us, not as large of an issue but we do keep it in mind in, as far as the recycling stream and making sure we're still getting good materials into the recycling stream. Yeah, and I think uh, just to add our experiences there, um, Neil, you, you know, there really, there really does not need to be a trade-off for print quality and, and sustainable solutions. I, I, I think that's one of the key challenges out there to those in the print industry or, or for, to solve and, and really to provide, I'd say, additional benefits, just as you suggest, with, um, with, with things like washable inks, inks that are designed to stay color fast and and um, it, it, remove from the substrate that you're looking to recycle in the caustic wash. So really uh, designing for that downstream, um, let's say market and or processes, which you, you, you had mentioned earlier um, in one of the discussions really about designing for uh, either designing for recycling or designing for circular economy. Um, any other ads there, Chavi or, or, or No, Neil? I think th to me, this is a, a good example, Shane, of what you are bringing, that you need to come up with sustainable <laughs> programs, but without, you know, sacrificing kind of the core tenants of your packaging, right? So in this case, if, if you know, you cannot print properly, you cannot properly communicate your brand, your message to consumers, etc., you need to go back to the drawing table, right? It could not be that sustainability is at the price of, uh, you know, your packaging to do a worse job at point of sale. So I, I definitely kind of encourage, uh, again, kind of people to look for alternatives. I think, it, you know, when you go up to the chain and kind of you need to present to business leaders, etc., new sustainable programs, it could not be that they are subpar versus the solutions that you already have. Very good. So PepsiCo and Gatorade, um, a, a, a key question and I think significant challenge that always seems to come up is how do we ensure the right balance between the consumer and the science-based inputs when developing new products? Yeah, I can take this one. Um, it's interesting. Um, you know, consumers know what they know, right? So I think that you, of course, you need to do consumer research and, you know, we leverage insights uh, on all our innovation programs. But we always said that we need to be, we need to have a strong point of view on kind of what are we trying to solve and ensure that the consumer inputs is just one input, but there are others that we need to take into consideration. So I always recommend to my team and to my peers is kind of a start a little bit with kind of what's the problem to solve, what's the brand strategy, then add this consumer desirability into the mix and then figure out, you know, what could be the scalability or the, of, uh, of this platform or, or the go-to-market. So um, I, I think that the consumer part is important, but I, I will balance these with all these other inputs in order to kind of measure the ideas the right way. Neil, any ads that, that you'd have there r related to the, the consumer and making that balance? Yeah, no, I, I think Shami said it well as, as far as you have to you, you have to listen as well, but you, you, you can't make bad decisions due to, uh, for lack of better terms, media. Um, it, it, so, so it's one of those, we, we keep the science-based approach, you, whether it be consumer, whether it be regulatory as well, you, you, we have different aspects that we have to keep balancing. It, it definitely goes back to, we, we don't look at it as a one size fits all. So we, we know there are different, there's differences in consumers. Um, we know there's differences between consumers as it even relates to our brands as well. So, so a Gatorade consumer might be different than a Naked Juice consumer. So, so um, we, we have different solutions and, and we want to keep those different solutions. One of the things I'll always say is I always want to make sure that packaging is able to give marketing the, the freedom 
for whatever they want to do uh, from that, but making sure that freedom is done in a, based in sustainable uh, metrics from it. So I would say it's keeping uh, keeping multiple capabilities open for different consumers. Yeah, one, one additional comment on that chain on, on this part of consumer. I think it's also important to filter what consumers are saying versus what consumers are doing, right? That the saying versus doing, it's, it's, a, it's a barrier there that it's very important to filter. That sometimes they say, well, are, are you interested in a recyclable solution? They said, yeah, of, of course. Uh, but then kind of when you show what it is, how much it costs, what they will need to do, etc., maybe this answer will differ. So we are a huge believers to kind of put these solutions and it as close to reality in front of consumers and then they, they, they react into that. And Chavi, uh, a, a follow on there, you, you had mentioned a bit earlier um, that, that education is really important. So, you know, education down, down the line on, on helping the consumer you know, understand what actions to take um, if they'd like to complete the the circular economy. And I, I wonder, um, I think Neil mentioned that there are differences in brands uh, in, in perhaps how consumers will engage. Um, which which makes complete sense. Are you also finding differences um, that may be uh, either geographic differences or generational differences in in how the consumers view circular economy, and then how you either design to that and or design and communicate? Yeah, I, I think you know one maybe obvious one is kind of the difference in, in geographies, right? So we know, for instance, that in Western Europe, you know, the whole sustainability circular economy GIFRA, is much more, you know, evident on kind of top on, on the agenda and top of, you know, consumers' mindset. So something to take in consideration. And then as part of our open innovation approach, we like to partner with, you know, uh, agencies or kind of, you know, insights coming from Western Europe because that we believe that that could be the wave that it's coming to North America now, right? So I, I think that's that's a good example of that. And I think it's, it's important to, um, uh, you know, try to stay ahead of the curve, right? So we always said, maybe, well, kind of sustainable packaging is not top of mind across all consumers, uh, you know, ages or kind of all consumers, you know, uh, demographics, etc., but it's relevant for uh, a specific target. Let's try to us drive the agenda versus reacting to that. And my, our uh, learnings is that younger generations are more sensitive on that. They they care more. And by the way, these are our core consumers. So that I think forces us to advance on this agenda. Very good. So we we do have some time for audience q a and chavi and neil we have received um some questions so if you don't mind i'll just choose some of these and pose them uh the first coming from the audience is that covid has rapidly accelerated e-commerce adoption what role does packaging innovation play in a digital first environment? Yeah, I can take this one. Um, you're right. I think COVID is accelerating e-com and, you know, we have all seen in the news that what is happening is kind of, you know, the revolution that should happen in five years. Now it's happening in five months. I think that the implications for, uh, for us uh, in terms of innovation and packaging is that we need to come up with more complex solutions. We always said that cheap, uh, ready to drink, cheap water, it's not a very good idea. So uh, all our initiatives that are beyond the bottle that deliver kind of these complex solutions that like could be pots, powders, tablets, etc. Now we have an extra incentive uh, to accelerate the innovation um, and kind of the supply chain model to bring these solutions to markets. Uh, that's that's number one. I think then the other one, more from a you know brand or business perspective, is that typically in e-commerce you try to drive as much value as possible on kind of on a on on a smaller 
packaging or box, right? So th the case of the iPhone, it's perfect, kind of a very compact box with kind of a high dollar ring. So what's what's the translation of this model into our industry? And, and then I think that anything that is about compact solutions, functional benefits, functional ingredients, etc. Now you could kind of sell these products for a higher dollar ring and then try to come up with a model that could be compatible with other products in e-com. So it's uh, fascinating uh, in terms of uh, evolution of our portfolio, what this e-commerce acceleration could mean for us. As it relates to COVID as a follow-on question to, to, to that one, are there are there any initiatives or or innovation activities um, from uh, PepsiCo or Gatorade that have, uh, I'd say, been inspired, um, if I can use that word, by uh, the COVID pand pandemic or the the, the um, current environment? Yeah, I would say probably uh, two very different ones. One, I think that there's a strong desire from consumers to look for uh, functional products that boost immunity. So we are, you know, exploring this space and coming up with uh, some innovation in the relatively short term on this idea kind of, you know, products reinforced with vitamins, etc. because, you know, that that's on trend and, you know, there is the need from consumers. And then another one on the other end of the spectrum, we were talking about reusable bottles and vessels, etc. What we have seen is that there is this uh, increased demand on kind of individualized solutions in terms of uh, vessels and bottles, right? So maybe in the past, uh, teams and athletes were willing to share the same cooler to get their drinks. That's kind of the old model. Now every athlete wants kind of uh, his bottle with his name, kind of no one, uh, no one touches this bottle. Even we have seen this in professional uh, sports, kind of the NBA, the NFL, kind of adapting all these solutions. And at the end, that's kind of an extra push towards uh, personalization and individualization. So we believe that for our uh, business on reusable vessels and kind of for people investing up front and kind of, okay, this is my bottle, only mine, only I, uh, I use it, etc. It's It's a new trend that we believe it's here to stay and we need to adapt to that and provide the right solutions to athletes. So again, two very different innovation opportunities, but it proves us that you know we need to be very humble and kind of adapting our innovation process to bring some of these solutions to, to market as soon as possible. Any adds to that, Neil, from a, in e either the e-commerce um, side or, or you know, new solutions addressing the the COVID issue? Yeah. Yeah. No. I, honestly, I think Shavi hit the two perfect examples that we have out there uh, for it, um, it and, and it's definitely the. I think the biggest thing is is what Shavi says. I don't think it's it. it changed our long-term approach except for the point of this is a massive acceleration curve uh, that we're in so glass half full i mean i, I think it does uh, make companies take a stronger look at how are we going to deliver some of these uh, trends that were on the way that COVID is just accelerating great let's move to the next question um here from the the audience how can CPGs drive sustainability for their products and or packaging when the responsibility is fractured across any number of departments? So this appears to be referring to um, silos within a business and, and really how do companies work to address that and, and, and specifically bring those impactful sustainable solutions for products and packaging into the market 
Yeah, um, I, I can address that from the technology side. I think we, we look at it in, in two in two ways. We want to give the BUs the freedom to be able to explore and look at its self solutions, but we do have centralized points. So we would you know, we have a corporate sustainability. Um, I had up actually sustainability not just for North America but for globally. So when we look at, at, at packaging materials uh, for sustainability for beverages, I have a look across the globe and how can they impact. And again, different solutions for different areas for that. But we do have a central point on understanding what those technologies are uh, so then we can go to each uh, segment and my role isn't unique within pepsi you have it on each of the departments where we have a centralized area and then it does disperse out to the different bus so um, you always have that central touch point uh, so and and it Again, this is a great area, um, especially with COVID, is of how are we sharing learnings from that? So how are we still keeping that communication up from it? Um, it, it takes dedication. It takes it takes a large chunks of people's times, and that's where I think PepsiCo has shown that dedication um, from a standpoint of sustainability does have um, – dedicated positions that are, are their core focus is around sustainability to help with that exact question that you're saying of how do we how do we keep that harmonized approach but i can't i can't stress enough when we say harmonized it's best practices but again it's giving the freedom to each of the bus to understand what they need to do yeah i, I will add that uh, you know it, it's complex and definitely kind of big companies to how to break these barriers it's 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 a challenge uh, one comment on top of uh, Neil's answer. Um, I think it's uh, it's a, a space that we have a lot of people, especially kind of on the marketing and even the other in the organization, young marketers that are very passionate about this space. So uh, in our case, what we have seen is that cross-functional teams driven by people that have kind of a personal uh, investment or incentive to make it happen and to drive change that helps many times to break barriers. So to me, it's a little bit kind of to reverse uh, the problem and said, well, kind of now we need to develop sustainable packages. I said, no, now we have the opportunity to educate athletes, to make a better world, to make it a little bit more aspirational, that then you could have this extra boost that sometimes help to break barriers. So we have put together this type of approach with kind of, you know, uh, cross-departmental uh, task forces on, behind some of these specific programs. And if you pick the right individuals that have these individual passions, I think that that helps a lot in terms of breaking barriers. And it certainly feels as a result of the, the discussion and what, what both Xavi and, and Neil, you've shared, you, I mean, you, you certainly come across very aligned and, and it, it, it does feel as though um, Pepsi has a very specific strategy against sustainability and that likely really helps to link your divisions as well as your functions um, to a common corporate goal yeah i will agree with that and especially if you could link sustainability to business right so it's kind of you know to to at the end we are not an NGO. We are here to deliver value to our uh, uh, stakeholders, right? So um, I think it's super important that you look um, the way that sustainability and innovation and packaging and the kind of a circular economy, et cetera, how this could bring value to the company. And, you know, I really encourage, you know, when, when you try to make things for a better world, et cetera, that's fine. And, you know, these efforts could have, you know, certain runway, but at the end, you need to look for the business angle. That's the way that you could unlock the resources um, to make these innovations uh, scalable. And at the end, this scalability is what it will impact uh, really consumers and, and the world. So I, I will encourage all innovation leaders kind of to look, I said, well, this program is cool, but kind of how I make it scalable, how I could kind of generate incremental revenue, new business opportunities for my company, that is, that is the type of boost that I think on the long uh, run will have a real impact. Yeah, I would agree. And, and and I think the other thing that Pepsi does is we frame them against uh, those four goals that, that that I brought up. And we have specific metrics against that. So when you do have a program, how does it go against your GHG? How does it go against your reduction of virgin plastics? How does it go against circular economy? So if you can frame your programs against that, then you're going to have synergies um, across the business as well. Thank you. Let's shift to the next question from the group. Um, 
so here it, it, uh, it really it's it's a question about the future trends as it relates to materials. An example that that shared again, this is specific from the audience, um, is the future paper or aluminum or something else? So really, this is about uh, a, a question to both you, Neil, as well as you, Chavi, related to materials, and is there uh, a current preference and or focus as it relates to materials? Um, I'll go from the technical side. Um we're, we're keeping a wide approach. Aluminum, paper, we're, we, we look at all the format. Aluminum, paper, glass, plastic. How, how are we looking at that? And each of them, I would say, is how, how are we making the, what is that advanced material for it? In their current state, um, the, there is no one solution that we can just jump to. So when, when we say paper, aluminum specific for this question, yes, we're looking into that. But how do you make, um, what, what are the aspects of paper that, that, that are great? Is it, is it the renewable resource standpoint? Is it the feel, the tactile feel of it? Um, um, and then what are the what are the what are the hurdles it has? What's your barrier capability for it? What's your what's your molding capability of it? Um, aluminum on the other side, very high GHG uh, Im impact potentially, depending on your weight and depending on your delivery system. So it's taking those each of those areas. What are the pros? What are the cons? How do you accentuate the pros? How do you decrease the cons uh, from them through the through the lens of sustainability? Um, and then I'm sure Shabby's going to go into this as far as what's the consumer acceptance for each of those. I'll pick on glass. Glass is the easy one. One way glass, horrible. People love it from a sustainability standpoint. Um, it's probably one of the worst things you could be in from a from, from a sustainability standpoint, especially from a one way standpoint. But what do they like about it? What, what's that appearance from it? Is returnable glass capable? Returnable glass changes that and puts it on its head uh, from that standpoint. But then you need to look at the business aspect of it of, of how do you make that survive so are we looking at materials yes we look at them quite uniquely in each in each standpoint so and Chad, yeah, I'll turn and it over to you. The, the idea of materials and perception that that's that's a tricky one right and i think that you know on, on plastic bottles is kind of they are kind of the devil and you know sometimes you know depending on how these bottles are kind of uh, designed manufactured collected etc it could be a very good solution. So I, I think it, go, it goes back to the educational uh, aspect, you know, that to try to come up with solutions and then explain consumers how these solutions should be used, right? So um, uh, I think that there is a, a risk of materials to just jump to the next cool thing uh, without understanding the full impact. And then, you know, going back to our prior discussion without understanding kind of the full scalability aspect, right? They said, well, kind of, yeah, this is cool, but kind of then how you package that, how you clean that, how you bring that to consumers. So I think there are many solutions out there that look cool for kind of a, a quick uh, 30 seconds uh, or one minute video on YouTube. But then when you explore how to implement that in a scalable business, then you face a lot of barriers. So I, I think that to, to think about the materials from kind of, you know, the, what it means for the consumers and how you implement these materials in your current or future supply chain is a, is a, it's a key question to, to be solved. So here's a, here's a really interesting question again from the audience. And I, I think we only have time for just this and perhaps one more, let, let, let's see, but what is, from your point of view, the beverage bottle of the future? Yeah, that's a million dollar question. Um, I, I think the honest answer is, I, I don't know, but I will challenge even the question. Are we sure it's a bottle, right? Um, my intuition is that uh, the future bottle of, 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 of the future it's it will be some kind of a combination of a reusable vessel with some kind of a you know compact product whatever something like that i, I think that the single use bottles on whatever material they will be limited to some specific uh, occasions when you are looking for this product call kind of maybe you know uh you know on on, on a convenience or you know store stuff like that but you know the usage of uh, of uh, single use bottles will be diminished over time, and I think that in general we need to think more about you know consumers carrying their own bottle uh, or multiple bottles across the day, and then how we are 
playing or adding value to these bottles, right? So even we can make these bottles smarter, kind of, kind of, they read how much consumers are drinking. They educate consumers on kind of what are the type of products that they need. You know, in these bottles, you could add, you know, multiple flavors, benefits, ingredients, etc., cetera, uh, just to add more value to this bottle that they are carrying. Um, I'm a little bit skeptical, skeptical on single-use plastic bottles outside a very specific occasion and channel. Yeah, I think you're spot on, Xavi. I, th I think it's it's really relooking at at what we we deem as as normal today. Um, old is new again as well. So I mean, how how are we looking at that exactly? The re the reusable platform, the um, but but making a consumer acceptable where it's it's it, you're going to give the consumer more flexibility for making their own customization. Um, so what you're going against you're going against the single use, uh, but you're giving them customization. You're giving them more freedom uh, for it. So, but then we also have to I mean. There is no one solution, and, and that's where I, I know I sound like a broken record on it, but that you're going to have different um, capabilities in different areas, um, water capabilities, um, usage, usage occasion capabilities uh, for it. So we're going to need to be open to there is going to be not one new bottle of the future. It's going to be different formats, but they will have more of that circular capability and more of the reusable. Um, uh, to to Shavi's point, uh, that's where my head is at, is it's more of that reusability uh, capability. Great. So one last question from the audience, just a slight shift here. Um, are, are, what innovations are happening on the manufacturing side for uh, packaged beverage or bottled beverage that may contribute to circular economy? Um, on the mat that would that would lend itself to circular economy. Um, one is from again where we're designing it and making sure our manufacturing capability is there. I think that a lot of it is scalability and um, Pepsi's built off of it's a very fast running machine. Um, it's it, but but we'll, we'll always use the phrase that you may have heard. It's 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 a it's an aircraft carrier. So you're you're turning an aircraft carrier. So I think part of it is making sure our manufacturing um, uh, partners are along with this when um, they they have to have the patience of sometimes sustainable materials aren't as efficient as current materials. Current materials have had the, have the years of track records of making it be able to run very fast on the line right now. Um, I think one of the things we're trying to work with right now is as these sustainable materials come up, they're smaller in scale. They're not, they haven't, they don't have the history of running on lines as long. So one of the biggest things we do is partner with our, 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 man, our supply chain counterparts of bring them along with the journey. It's not just about TE. It's not just about efficiencies on the line anymore. It's about the corporate goal against sustainability. So making sure that they have those goals built into their um, objectives and, and, and their and their goals uh, for the year, just as Xavi and I have. So it's, it's bringing them along to where they're not feeling as they just need to pump out material off the door. They're looking at they need to pump out material out the door that, that Pepsi is proud to put their, their badge on and it's very sustainable. So um, it, it's going to be a growing journey. Technologies from the manufacturing side are going to be catching up as materials are moving quicker. Fantastic. Well, thank you, Chavi and, and Neil. And uh, this will just conclude our session. Uh, a quick recap. Um, so certainly, I think a few things that we've learned. One is, is really to understand both the issues um, and, and trends as it relates to circular economy, take into account um, the the consumer needs and, and also the ability and and knowledge to communicate to the consumers how best to achieve their goals in circular economy. Um, the focus of development really needs to be on delivering against those consumer needs overall and helping the to drive growth in the business. So really driving. Uh, profitable solutions, things that are meaningful. And by way of doing that, um, th the sustainability really will occur because you're delivering uh, uh, solutions that, that are important to consumers al along with the um, design for circular economy uh, and, and ultimately um, communicating that well so that it is achieved. The other 
component that we heard today is is around partnerships and the ability to scale great solutions. Uh, and that requires, from what we, we've learned, it really partnering both up and down the supply chain um, to, to, to really enable the full value. So, so helping the new technologies get off the ground, built into scalable solutions, delivered into the market um, with well-communicated benefits, uh, as well as the goals of, of recovery or reuse and, and really being able to help the consumer understand how best to achieve those. So Chavi and Neil, we really appreciate your time today um, in this discussion. I, I think that it's been very helpful, certainly to me, and. And, and I, I know the audience, given the questions that we've had, have also been extremely engaged. So thank you. Uh, with that, Malini. Yes, thank you, Shane. And thank you all for sharing these great insights and for being so generous with your time today. A reminder for our audience to look out for an email within the next two hours with links to download today's material. And we would also like your feedback. So if you could take a minute to answer our very brief survey that will pop up on your screen at the end of the session, that will be very much appreciated. On behalf of INC International and Master Servants webinars, we would like to thank you all for joining us. And we do hope that you will be listening at our next webinar. Thank you. <laughs>